Hi everyone, how are we doing tonight? Who wants to go home now? <laughs> oh, nobody, all right. Um, yeah, so it's been, it's been great for me to come, kind of come back to Singapore. I, I, I came last time, I think, one year ago or so for exactly four hours. So I'm very happy to be back. So thank you so much for having me. Uh, now, this talk is dirty. Well, it's not that dirty. But what I want to show is a couple of techniques and a couple of things that we've been working on, that we've been doing, and that maybe you will be profiting from in your projects. But it requires me to know that you feel comfortable with dirty code. <laughs> Who feels comfortable with dirty code? <laughs> Who doesn't feel comfortable with dirty code? Who just doesn't like to raise hands, <laughs> just in general? OK, a couple of people, all right. Um, yeah, so what you're going to see, you hopefully will not be able to forget, but I don't, don't take any credit or responsibility. Now, this is me. At least this is how things used to look like back in the day. They changed over time. Um, I co-founded this little website a while back, uh, 11 years ago, actually. Uh, and it has grown, has become red. We will talk about this. That's OK. But what I want to talk specifically today is about techniques which we learned from building this. And I want to cover half of this talk being mostly design, so if you're a designer, that's probably going to be for you. And the other half is going to be mostly about front-end techniques that we learned. Both in performance, both CSS, JavaScript, whatever you want, right? So we'll get to that. But we'll start with design, and more specifically, visual design. And we had a really remarkable talk just before us. Um, and I feel like this is indeed what is happening on the web. It feels very similar. It feels very much the same. It lacks a bit of personality. We could use a bit more personality. But the question is, how do we frame personality into our design? How do we you know, inject this kind of level of personality in there? And I think it has to do with the way of how we perceive design, how we perceive the workflow, the design workflow. Very often, you will find uh, this actually being true. I have to navigate a little bit. Right, that's better. The design process is weird and complicated in many ways uh, because it involves people and systems and organizations which often are weird and complicated. I'm not sure about Asia or Southeast Asia. It's totally true in Europe. Totally true in Europe, right? So because why? Well, because many managers tend to think that this is a creative process. You start somewhere and go, and you iterate and 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 iterate, and at some point you hit the finish line and you're done or you're dead. Well, one of both. But most of the time, it's not like that at all. I think that most of us here sitting in the room will agree that the creative process, be it design, be it development, be it devel uh, designment or divinerment, whatever you want to call it, because most people are doing both, well, we always try to explore. We explore options. We try to find the best option. And in the end, we might hit a dead end, right? And then we need to recover from this dead end by continuing somewhere else. And this can be very time consuming and very, very expensive. So what do we do instead? We tend to rely on patterns. We tend to rely on generic solutions, right? <laughs> How many of these websites are you designing or building today? Because there are only two, right? Well, some of them, they have a difference sometimes. Some of them have a carousel at the top. Some of them <laughs> carousel at the bottom. But on average, they are going to look the same, right? Or how many of you would consider yourselves to be pixel pushers from start to finish? Every day, you come back to your project and you say, well, that border radius, let's make it 12, not 11. <laughs> right? That left margin, let's make it half an M more. Just that, that you know, it feels better. Right? So we kind of go through years of iteration, kind of maybe sometimes losing the big picture. And the reason why, I think, is because we tend to stick to the rules. Rules are important. Everybody respects best practices. Jeremy, do you respect best practices? He does. <laughs> but maybe we shouldn't. Maybe we shouldn't. Because you know they tell us what to do, but maybe we know better sometimes. Maybe we can break things to recover from them later. Everybody tells us you should not define the line height in pixels. Please don't. Right? But you know, uh, this is a best practice. So we take it for granted and we use it. And everybody tells us you should not base the breakpoints on device sizes. And we should not take the name of the Lord performance in vain. Right? <laughs> This is not how it works. So what does it become? What does it become as a result? Well, if you're a creative designer or developer, you set up in front of, uh, you sit down in front of a canvas, and you start working on a new project, right? And you have uh, some content to organize and navigation to organize. So you start doing this. This is probably something that will be familiar to most of you. But then, somebody comes to you. I hope the audio works. Somebody comes to you and tells you, no. 
Audio, please. Yes, perfect. Uh, somebody tells, no, 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 this is not how it works. You know, the best practice is start mobile first. You should start mobile. You say, okay, I'm going to start mobile. So I have to put navigation somewhere. So, you know, I know a fancy, fantastic place for navigation. <laughs> it's, I know this is a perfect place, right? But then somebody comes to you and tells you, no, 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 no. Right? <laughs> Don't use the hamburger icons because if you have something important to show, just show it. You will not hide the con you know, call to action button, for example. You know, you want to display it. You say, all right, so I have to put navigation somewhere. So it's going to be over here. And I, need I still have some content to organize. So I'm going to put it down here. But then somebody comes to you and tells you no. <laughs> right? Some of you might have been in this situation before. So you know, what it's <laughs> so you know how to solve it because the content has to be up there, there somewhere. So, you know, you know a carousel is a nice pattern to use. <laughs> so as a result, this becomes a creative process, right? Welcome to the new era of web design. And I feel so sad about this because maybe sometimes we really need to break out entirely. And one of the first things we always do when we start working on a new project, which is actually also what we did here, no, not here, uh, on the redesign is, what if you had to redesign whatever you're building on today, but you couldn't use any rectangles or circles. You can't use any rectangles or circles. What would you use? What is not a rectangle, not a circle? There is something else, I'm sure. A triangle. <laughs> that was not the point, right? <laughs> right? But you, can, you have to start thinking about, you know, maybe there is something else. Because we can create, potentially we can create something like this on the web today. This is a beautiful, nice layout, but very often it kind of flows into a template becoming this. Which I guess many of you would agree is not the same as this. Right? But I think we can do a bit more. And I think we can and we should break things sometimes. And more specifically, it has to deal with the fact that maybe sometimes we need to tell a strong story. And I want to bring us to this nice little case study from Tijuana Flats, which is a network chain, uh, chain, Mexican food chain in the US. And they have a very strong branding and they have a very strong story to tell. This is if you walk into a store, this is what it's going to look like, right? Walls painted, huge walls painted all the time. And they even hire graffiti artists who would come and repaint it every two months or so. And I mean, they're not small, these walls, right? These are the people, regular people, these are the walls, right? So they're pretty big. So they would come in and they would repaint and repaint and they're telling a story, right? And of course the restaurant menu reflects that as well, right? And their website reflects it as well. Now how would you build this? I mean, you might hate it. You might hate it, you might like it. But you will agree, I think, that this is a very unique personnel. Not every website looks like this, right? It has its own voice, and it's super heavy, and it's you know, everything that we should not be doing, right? But it has a voice, and it speaks in that unique voice. Now, they did a big bang redesign last year, and they moved away from this to this. Right? This is wonderful. Right? This is performant. This is fa there are no carousels here. Right? This is flat. Right? So it's, it's magnificent, right? But you're losing the personality here, right? So maybe we should be creating more like this. Maybe something like this has its place on the web. Right? This is a conference. <laughs> this is a website designed by Blumberg for the, to promote the conference. And they actually sold out quite quickly. And they use everything we're not supposed to be using. <laughs> right? But you, know, you can pull it off if it's a project like this. And you can pull it off. Um, there is a lot of animation in use. I mean, what was the last time you used Marquee? <laughs> Probably a long time ago. I'm not saying it's for every project, but sometimes when we get to that, you can manipulate and play a bit. <laughs> yeah? And they even went further because they literally hired a group of designers who were given the freedom to do whatever they want. So, oh yeah, they went all the way. So they would create these features. You know, it's December 2016, by the way. They would create these features which are anything but best practices again, right? <laughs> And they would just run with them. And there are tons of those features everywhere, all over the place. But we still need accessibility. This content should still be accessible. It's just the style around it that can be very, very different. And I'm not thinking that everybody could benefit from this. 
right? But for them, it was either die or reinvent themselves, right? Because, you know, if you think about Bloomberg, how, can it, how is it different from anything else like MSNBC and all the others? Now, now they're different. All of a sudden, they're seen as this kid around the corner, the design kid around the corner, unlike everybody else. And I'm not saying that we should be creating something like this all the time, like really inaccessible, really weird how it affects on the cursor. I think you appreciate it. That's, that goes a bit too far, I think. But if you think about it in a more humble way, right, maybe the same idea applied in a more humble, humble way might go a long way. Right? That's pretty nice. Why not? And sometimes this is how strong a story can be. Because if you look into the Hans Brinker Hotel website, this is a story you will never forget. How many of you are familiar with this story? Hans Brinker Hotel? Oh, you have no idea what's expecting you. You have to remember, mark that date in the calendar. So this is Hans Brinker Hotel. And this is a hotel in Amsterdam, Netherlands. And you know, it's not a good hotel. <laughs> right? It's, it's not a good hotel. So they're struggling a lot of, you know, to sell spots in the hotel. So they had a decision to make. So what do we do? Do we close down? or we try to attract customers somehow. And I said, that, you know, we, we, can't, we don't have the money to invest. We can't be the best hotel in the world. There is no money for it. So let's be the worst hotel in the world, <laughs> right? We can, we can become the absolute worst hotel experience in the world. And of course, the website has to reflect it. So they hired a designer for one burrito. He got paid one burrito for it. Uh, and a professional copywriter, right, to create this website. Oh, wait a second. Let me go back. Right? And it's, you know, again, everything that we probably shouldn't be doing all together in one place, from navigation to readability to everything. It has some really interesting features that you will probably never be able to forget. Right? For example, if let me just scroll down here. So this is probably, oh, yes, just a second. So you see, not. <laughs> You say, don't use like buttons, use 50 like buttons, right? But I must say that they're performant, actually. They're not really like buttons, they're images, so... Mm, well, still bad, but you know, uh, you know. And sometimes also people will tell us, you know what? No, we could not, we should not use pop-ups. Another pop-ups, lightbox is horrible. Well, this is the best pop-up in my life. <laughs> this is so annoying, I love it, right? I can't get rid of it, it's really amazing. I wish every website had a pop-up like this. Well, not every website, but you get the idea. But of course, I'm exaggerating at this point. But we all need to find one little thing that makes us different. This is what personality is all about. This guy decided, you know, I can create, create a portfolio, just a simple 12-column grid, like everybody else, or I'm going to split myself into three parts, <laughs> right? And then whenever you hit the page, it's going to be random with a different background color. That's his signature. That's one thing that makes him different. And the same way, we also can use animation, for example, or transitions to do the same thing. If you didn't have animations or transitions here, it would look like exactly everything else on the web. But this little thing over here, right, when you just hover or tap on this area, this is the only thing that's different, and they use it consistently everywhere. In the same way, like here, this little effect of items appearing after each other with a little delay, just a little delay of maybe 70 or 80 milliseconds, as you will see in a second, right? You start loading the page, and these things pop up. And then as you scroll down, you see these geometric shapes, which then become the actual content. That's one little thing that can be used a lot, right? So the question is, of course, how are you going to find it? How are you going to use it? Because we could create things like this. We could. <laughs> But I would argue that it's probably not the most useful thing ever. You, I can look at it like all day long. I don't know why it exists. It's just remarkable. Right? But this is not the point. Right? So we asked ourselves, so okay, in our project, how are we going to do this? Right? What would be our personality? How do we apply this? And what I want to show is kind of a little bit of what we learned in this process. And I think that it's really interesting to see that what has been very beneficial for us is to start thinking about designing text first. Not thinking, not even thinking about visual design at all. So the first mock-up would look like this. We would basically write down the main structure, the main wording, and the main copy that we're going to use on the site. 
And in fact, one of the very first things that we did was not only those light boxes here to kind of really figure out what the language is going to be, but error messages. This was one of the first things we designed, right? Because why? Well, because if you can delight, in a way, the customer in the point when they fail, right, and turn them into you know, something like funny or something interesting where they say, oh, this is nice, right? This is the point where you can really get that customer, right? So we spent a lot of time designing those error messages. Instead of saying, hey, we're missing your first name, it says, you know, no cat is an island, you better have a name, you'll probably have a name, right? And this kind of stuff is everywhere, all over the place. And then, of course, eventually, we also started working around the typography and started looking at different options for typography. And we picked up that typeface for body copy and that typeface for headings. And I hate this typeface. But look at this A, right? I hate it so much, but it fits really well with our personality, right? Because we had to ask around, we had to embrace how people perceive us. And very often, when, people, when we ask people, so what do you think of Smashing Magazine, they wouldn't say professional, respected, highbrow publication. They would say things like quirky, informal, right, and things like that. So we had to embrace it. And we had to find a typeface that would actually em embrace it. And I really can't stand it. I mean, look at this. Uh. <laughs> but that's actually fitting. It really does work well. And another thing that always popped up was people kept talking about cats. Well, because we have five conferences a year, and we promote those conferences on the site, on Twitter, and everywhere. So people were associating these cats, which are everywhere, with us, right? And we said, OK, so cats, well, let's go all the way. So we ended up creating tons and tons of cats as a result. Many, 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 many. Many cats, like many, many cats, right? In fact, 57 at this point. If you find all of them, and I hid them in a print style sheet as well. <laughs> so just in case, it's not like you, but if you find all of them, I guarantee I'm going to pay myself for your trip to anywhere in the world with hotel and stuff. You will not find them, <laughs> right? But it was also about finding the right angle. And I literally, literally mean it. Right? We started walking around and trying to play with this idea of what would be our personality, what would be a slightly different angle to look at on the side. And we started looking at the layout like this and vertical, like this, headings, right? And kind of just playing and figuring out what we can do. One thing that we decided quite quickly is to use this little thing, this kind of, uh, the angle, the angle here, as a consistent signature for the entire site. So everything is tilted. And we actually changed the design, you might have noticed, from 10.6 degrees tilting to 11 degrees. It was a big step for us. <laughs> it was a very, very big step for us. But then everything is tilted. Every single, oh, well, literally, almost every single thing is tilted in this way, right? So the avatars, you will find like buttons and other things. And this was kind of the first mock-up that we created. And along the way, we also set up a pattern library, a style guide, to actually protocol everything, which is unfortunately out of date now. But we own it, we own it. But then everything, everything had to be tilted, right? Exactly 11 degrees, kind of setting up a couple of documents to explain why we're doing this <laughs> and what would be our thing, right? And again, for you, it could be something as well that simple. It doesn't have to be a big thing. Think about that signature that would be just you. Everything is exactly 11 degrees, right? And so it evolved over time. And then at some point, we started looking at interaction design as well, kind of playing with this idea of tilting and then this is how article page came to be. Then it evolved over time a little bit, and evolved, and evolved, and has become this, right? And actually, many people really hate this layout now. And every single time I run an interview, everybody, well, not everybody, but many people will complain about this block being too big, right? And I think this is very, very important to keep it this way, because it's all about the community and the people around it. Very often, authors don't get enough credit, and it's better to give them more credit, too much credit even, than too little. Right? And in the end, we went away from this towards redness all the way. Right? <laughs> we will talk about it later, if you want to. Right? But this was kind of the visual part. Another thing that was really, really important as well, just as a little technique, is to kind of really pay a lot of attention to all those fine details. So one of the techniques I'm using all the time is to record usability tests in slow, and then watch it in slow motion, like literally slow motion. So it played back and forth to really see everything happening on the screen. 
And then whenever you have a visual noise or something weird, you can really make sure that everything works fine. Have tons of files like this, and slow motion is a really cool thing to do it, I think. But it also requires you to be quite focused, right? And it was not always the case because of this. Right? <laughs> so we spent a lot of time designing those cats. I mean, this is, there was a lot of time. Every, we have even a scuba diving cat at this point. This is remarkable. But there are many, many, many of those, right? But it was also important to really pay attention. I would print out things like this on a big piece of paper and just stare at it for two hours or so. Right? And there is something that's so horrible in, the, in here, so horrible, you must spot it right away. There is a big problem in here. OK, there are many problems, apparently. <laughs> All right. uh, but there is something that's really, really bad. <laughs> we'll talk about it later. Yeah. <laughs> but there is something really critical. I couldn't stand it. And this is, of course, because you noticed this. Right? This is not OK. Right? This is not fine. So we had to plug in a, a soft hyphen before and after just to make sure it's the right small caps. Um, because you, know, you want to have proper tabular num numerals, not just this. This is just horrible. So this is, of course, way better, right? Uh, OK. OK, not the, what I was expecting. That's OK. So this against this, of course, clear who the winner is, right? And then, of course, again, talking about the focus, you, know, you start this new GitHub, GitHub um, issue and stuff. Pull request, and then you say minor adjustments for speakers and talks, and then the first things: more cat illustrations, <laughs> cat with dog outfit, conference selector, adding new cat illustrations, <laughs> horizontal lines for meow content. Right? <laughs> Went all the way, literally all the way. We were actually thinking about it at some point. So, you know, we want to take it all the way. Right? Now, have you ever used emoji <laughs> in your HTML? <laughs> Now, it's really kind of difficult to debug at times, <laughs> right? But, and it's also very difficult because there are actually seven or, or eight different cat emoji. <laughs> so you have to be really specific about you know, what you're doing. But it brought us to thinking maybe we could play with this. So what we definitely we want to use is, of course, this. <laughs> that, I think, is pretty cool. And this is a really fancy emoji. And compressor swell as well, right? So that's pretty cool. Right? Now, this is kind of just about the visual part. I have no idea how I'm doing on time. Sandra, tell me. No. OK. <laughs> yes. Right? So the other thing that was also interesting, because we had to look into the front end side of things, and we also wanted to use all the fancy technologies and stuff, but we needed to know how far can we go. Can we go CSS grid first? Well, no, because it didn't, wasn't supported at all one and a half years ago. So, but we probably should have gotten Flexbox first, but then how do we deal with you know, that browser, mostly i8? How are we going to deal with it? So we had to look into browser stats, and this is what it looked like in December 2015, right? where we had, obviously, Chrome, Firefox, Safari leading. That was pretty nice. I mean, when you, once you get stats like this, you feel very comfortable to do whatever you want. Right? But then, of course, we should be talking about something else. That, browsers. <laughs> Now the tension rises. I can see it in your eyes, right? So that was nice in a way, right? So that's like, all right, so we don't have to worry about it, about it too much, right? But this is not entirely true because there is one person being super annoying once every two years coming to the site with the user agent spoofed being 666. <laughs> that one person, I don't know if he or she is in the room. If you are, please come to me. You're going to get something, I'm sure. This always skews my statistics with one little spike throughout the entire year, one little spike for one person using IE666. Right? Another thing we had to ask ourselves is what are we going to do with frameworks? What are we going to use? Are we going to use React? Are we going to use Angular? Are we going to use something entirely different? What would be the back end? Right? But in the very beginning, we started thinking about what if we try to avoid frameworks as much as we can. And when I talk about frameworks, I don't specifically talk about you know, React and others, but even like bigger libraries that have established themselves over time. One of them being jQuery, right? So it was really interesting. Just a couple of days ago, I ran this poll. I am using jQuery in production these days by default, or like in general. And 40% are still using it, right? Although many people are kind of trying to move away. How many of you are using jQuery? Okay, how many of you 
they removed jQuery recently or so. Well, probably it's the same. It probably reflects this data as well. And we actually didn't want to use big libraries at all because this is how we feel when we use libraries. Some things are just not clear, but they're quite small, so you can you know, find your way to it. But this is how we feel when we use frameworks. There are many unknowns, and you just don't know what to do first. Right? So we wanted to avoid frameworks altogether by at the first. Another thing we wanted to avoid is meteor queries. And you want to ask yourself, what the hell? Why meteor queries? What, what did they do wrong? Right? <laughs> well, the reason is very simple. Because if you think about media queries, and whenever you work on responsive design today, well, you'll find out yourself, find yourself in this weird situation where you have, you're stuck. So you design a mobile view, you design a large view, desktop view or whatever, and then you kind of expect the design to beautifully transition between these two spots, between these two optima. But this is usually not going to be the case. Right? If you look at this example, if you put this on the spectrum, right, let's say where you design the perfect uh, tablet size view and the perfect desktop, at some point in between, things will start breaking, right? Now, this is normal. This is just how things are, right? Because text is different and things like that. But then what do you do? Well, you add a new breakpoint. And then things break again. Then you add a new breakpoint. And then eventually, you know, maybe a week or two later, you realize you have tons of media queries, very different media queries, and you have to maintain it all. So maintenance-wise, it's a really big deal. So we thought maybe we can avoid it altogether. And so what we decided to do is actually use some of the techniques that covered back out today already in our layout in pretty much everything else without media queries. So it's of course responsive, but it doesn't use media queries. So remember this layout, right? Can you think about how you would build this? You think, oh, that'd be, oh whatever. We, we can do anything at this point. We are smart people here in the room. Well, we tried hard to really make it work. It took a lot of time and passion and lots of conversations in Trello to actually make it work, right? Um, I don't want to show everything, but a couple of things which are important to know. The reason how you would build this to make it work well everywhere. Well, you have these three sections, first, second, third, right? So what you do is you don't float section one, you float section two to the right, you float section three to the left, you pull sections two and three up by applying negative bottom margin to section one, then you push section two back down, this one, right? Back down using top margin, and then you create pseudo element inside section three to create space where three overlaps with one. Right? Yeah, it's not that difficult. It just, <laughs> it just took us like two months or so of work, right? But then things get more interesting. Because obviously, you also want it to be responsive, right? So what we ended up doing is this. Let me just show you something else in a sec for before, we, before we go there. Now, ideally, what we would love to have is this kind of flexibility. You define a component, let's say a layout once, right? And then you change, let's say, a font size somewhere within the media query or so, and it becomes bigger, and then you make it again smaller, and it becomes smaller, right? Without having to fiddle a lot with media queries. And more specifically, you want to have a certain function that describes that behavior. How many of you feel comfortable with math? Who doesn't feel comfortable with math? There'll be m a lot of math coming up. Just saying. So you want to describe this function. I need more, maybe like five or 10 minutes more. That's it. So if you have this function, you can describe it. So if you write it down once, right? It will describe the behavior of your component. That would be wonderful. But more specifically, we don't want this. Because if you think about typography, well, it's just if you scale it down, it will become too small. If you scale it up, it becomes too big. You kind of want to have a predictable growth. So it starts growing in here, and then it reaches a certain maximum, and then that's it. Like think about H1, H2, H3, and so on, right? So if you wanted to describe this function, you probably would need to describe something like this, which of course would call for something like this, right? Now, there is no way to solve this with CSS, <laughs> right? You can solve it with JavaScript, but with not with CSS. So the only thing you could do, right, is kind of try to go, uh, kind of break it down into parts and then um, try to approximate it, but this goes way too complex. It's, this is a bit too complex, I think, for CSS, right? <laughs> so our goal is to do this, right? So it wanted to kind of start growing and become smaller over time, just as automatically. It's not playing, just a second. No. All oh, right, that's right, so you scale it down, Everything just at some point, no. 
okay, becomes smaller. You will see in a second what I mean anyway. All right. So it becomes small and then it stops shrinking. And then you grow it and it becomes quite big and then it stops growing, right? That's what we want to achieve exactly with this. In order to do this, the only thing you need to know, and this is super easy if you know how it works, is to use this formula. When you set a calc, which was mentioned before, on font size, and then you kind of grow between two different values of a certain um, viewport width and height, or height, right? Now, you don't need to memorize it. I'll sh share the slides anyway. But the idea is very simple. You choose the minimum, choose the maximum, and then how it grows over a certain screen size area, right? And then you're basically just defining it in this formula, and you're done. And you end up with things like this, being done out of the box without media queries at all. So it's, you, I mean, you can use media queries, but you don't have to, right? So you resize it, you make it smaller, you make it bigger. It just becomes, it just grows naturally all the time. It's not like you have to plug in media queries all the time. I was so happy when Mike Rittmuller from Australia actually came up with this technique. I was like, yes, yeah. I mean, it made my day, literally. And just in case you're wondering, Obviously, Calc is well supported, except you know who, but we're used to do it at this point, I guess. And the fallback will be obviously for you know who uh, pixels, right? And you can apply it everywhere. And we applied it everywhere. Not just for font sizes, for line height, for padding, for margins, for width, for height, for anything, for border radius, damn it. Even I tried to use it for animation, <laughs> but it was weird, so it didn't work really, right? But the idea then is quite simple. You can apply it literally everywhere. Think about the line height. Normally, we want to grow between 1.3 to 1.5, right? Within a certain area. We don't want this uncontrolled growth or shrinking. We want a very specific growth in a specific area, right? So we end up with this using exactly the same formula. We want to grow from 1.3 to 1.5 between 21 amps and 35 amps, right? So you have exactly the same formula. You have the minimum, you have the area over which you grow, and then you have a difference between the two and you're set and you're done. And you end up with this for free. You can use media queries if you want to, but you don't have to. Just kind of naturally going from 1.3 to 1.5. And even layouts like this, where literally everything is affected by this formula, right? don't use media queries at all. Sometimes they want to turn it on. Sometimes they want to turn it off. So one technique, which might sound scary, but please bear with me is to set font size in calc, right, using VW, v, v, VW and VH units. How many of you are familiar with VW units? OK, so most of you. It's just 1% of its viewport width, right? And because it relates to viewport, it will scale up and down. And then if you need something fixed, you just set up a uh, container, which is going to have a fixed font size, and everything inside is going to be defined in amps, so it's going to stay fixed. So you end up with this. Right? So this block, the advertising unit or whatever, stays fixed. Everything else grows up and down as you wish. No media queries at all. The same thing in here, if you want the other way around, probably it's going to be the usual use case. You set the HTML on the right, as you always do on font size 100%. And then you have this fluid environment with a, where a container is defined using calc, and everything inside is defined using font size. Right? And you end up with this. Again, no media queries used at all. Right? And so if we look into this layout, this is exactly what we ended up doing, right? Think about this. Like every single thing, the navigation, the padding, the size here, here, the padding over here, those buttons, the image width and height, the padding around it, the margin around it, everything is defined using calc. So this natural growth is kind of right all the time because it, you know, we're kind of describing the behavior of every single component just using this magical property or magical function. So as you keep growing, everything just kind of becomes a bit, a bit bigger, and the padding increases as well, right? Then you keep going and going. I can go do it forever, right? And the font size changes just like by 0 0.05 pixels, and it keeps kind of growing and growing, right? And as a result, this is what we ended up with, right? Literally, everything has these magical numbers, which are just experimental numbers. We just started looking, so is, it, is the growth good enough or not? We were not solving mathematical equations, just in case you're wondering, right? Now, this is kind of one of the, I think, the most important things that we need to know when we're designing today, because this can go a long way. However, one thing to know there, it doesn't, is, it doesn't matter what you do, you will always end up with things going wrong. 
So this is how I feel most of my time. And it's a bit sad, but that's okay. Because, you know, maybe eventually if we break things and we try to experiment and try to figure out what would be the best way to do things, maybe we can, you know, break things first and then restore them later. So this is how I feel most of the time. Welcome to my world. That's just sad. <laughs> but I have cats. Cats. So thank you, and I'm looking forward to conversations afterwards. <laughs>